been a while since I've been up here. I don't think I've been up here since COVID. I think the last time I was here, one of my parakeets had died and I was putting it in the freezer. You guys remember that? <laughs> well, uh, during um, Snowmageddon, another parakeet died, but I didn't have to put it in the freezer. We just took it out back and threw it in the ice. And when it thawed out, we buried her. Um, so we have one parakeet left, a parakeet named Cha-Cha. And I think he's really upset all the time because he's a boy, but we didn't know that. <laughs> and it's kind of like a boy named Sue kind of feel. My wife called him Cha-Cha. He looked like Cha-Cha. So anyway. Anyway, First Thessalonians. Um, I've been noticing as I've been going through this with the men on Saturdays, um, something that Paul has been, actually a few things that seem to be very Pauline in their, their origin and in his idea of how to live out life. And one of those things is that there's a difference between us and them. Well, who's them? Them? center okay better okay um, if you look back in first Thessalonians at the end and he's talking about the rapture and he we're, we're gonna be in second Thessalonians but in first Thessalonians he talks about uh, groups of people he talks about groups of people that would be going in the rapture because there was some confusion about, you know, they thought that their loved ones had already, who had died, missed the rapture. So Paul explained, no, there's, there's like two, three groups of people. There's a group of people who are going to be here and they're going to go in the rapture if it happens during their lifetime. There's actually a, like group 1A, those are people that are going to be dead in Christ before the rapture. Okay, and then there's group two. Okay, group one and one A are good groups. You want to be in those groups. You don't want to be in group two. Okay, group two is where Paul actually says that, you know, those are the ones who have no hope. Okay, because when they pass away, or if they're still here on the earth during that time, they're going to have to go through hell, basically. And so he kind of carries that theme over. And uh, when we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, before we get into that, I just want to give you a little background. Um, I think Philippi was probably Paul's favorite church. He seemed to have a, an affinity for them. Uh, but if that was true, then Thessalonians was his second favorite church, the Thessalonians. Um, because he really commended both of these churches. It's interesting that both of these churches seem to be poor. And they seem to be going through conflict and affliction and tribulation. Okay? So just kind of keep that in mind. And we'll actually look at that. You know, they were suffering persecution. And they were probably struggling. Um, both of these Thessalonian epistles that Paul wrote, he wrote during his second missionary journey. Um, the sequence is, you know, you can look at Acts 16 where Paul's thrown in jail in Philippi and he suffers. He gets, you know, chained up. He gets beaten and whipped. And then after that, in, 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 in Acts 17, he goes to Thessalonica. And um, he's there. And he's only there for about three weeks, we think. At least that's all scripture acknowledges. You know, it says he was there for three Sabbaths. May have been there longer. Probably not. But in any case, um, he's there, and he's there until a riot breaks out. Okay, so if you're Paul, this is kind of like your normal day. You know, you go, you preach, a riot breaks out, you leave, you get thrown out of town, whatever. <laughs> and so uh, then from there, he went to Berea, you know. And, but the Jews from Thessalonica actually were so upset at Paul that they followed him there, and they started another riot. And so uh, he left for Athens in Acts 17. And then in Acts 18, he comes into Corinth. 
And according to Acts 18.11, he stayed in Corinth for 18 months. Okay? So we think that's where he wrote both epistles to the Thessalonians. They're probably a year, maybe you know, a little bit more than that apart from each other. And so with that, uh, I want to take a look back real quick. Um, turn to 1 Thessalonians. I know I said second. We'll get there. Go to 1 Thessalonians. I want to read verses 2 through 9 just to give you an idea of how Paul opened that first letter. Okay, I'm going to assume you guys are all there. It wasn't <clears throat> very far to go. And in verse 2, he says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. So this fledgling congregation whom he had very little influence over as far as time's concerned in a temporal sense, apparently he had a great influence, a great impact over their lives. These are people that he's addressing. They fall in the group one or one A category because they've been impacted by the gospel. And it's very important to remember that. He says in verse four, knowing beloved brethren your election by God for our gospel did not come to you in word only but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake and you became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit that's interesting they, their lives, they were experiencing affliction. They were experiencing persecution from the people around them. You know, they were Gentiles. They'd come out of a, a, a culture that was pagan. And then they had this Jewish influence there as well. But they suffered affliction with joy. That's interesting because there's a dichotomy there, you know, that, that, that we can all experience, I think. But I don't most of the time. I'll be honest with you. And it's not that the word is deficient or that the Holy Spirit is deficient or that God is deficient anyway. It's me. I'm the problem. So if you're experiencing that, you're the problem too. Anyway, verse 7. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and at Kai, who believe Macedonia is Macedonia, Kai is basically the Greek provinces. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned from God or excuse me, to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You know, there, there's, there, there's, there's a lot there. You know, the impact, the contrast, the, the change that had happened, it was so impactful. And people around knew, you know, these people, hey, did you check out the Thessalonians? Look at them. They're like different. They're weird and stuff now, like they do to us, right? And, but... Paul makes this great distinction here. You know, he would go out and people would tell him about what happened because it was such an impactful event. You know, it's kind of like the, the resurrection. You know, it was so impactful that it changed people's lives. And that's why historians can't explain it away because they can come up with all their theories, swoon theory, um, mythical theory, um, just um, he, he, double twin in there, space alien, I've heard that one. Um, but you cannot deny the impact of a changed life. And so here, Paul is, is, is relating to them how their lives are so impactful that he would go and people would tell him about his encounter with the Thessalonians. 
how they turn from to God, the true God, from idols, okay, to serve the living and true God. If it wasn't true, it wouldn't really be worth living for, and certainly not dying for. It is true, though. The gospel's true. So we move on. And with that, that's kind of our intro to, to the Thessalonians. Let's, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. And this might not take very long, because I don't have my usual 13 pages of notes. So you guys are lucky, but I can probably come up with some stuff, so maybe not. So, verse 1. Paul... Silvanus and Timothy, they're the ones, you know, Paul wrote the letter, he's accompanied by Silvanus and, or Silas and Timothy there in Corinth. Um, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he gives a standard greeting from Paul. You know, it's important. You got to remember these words they kind of get meaningless sometimes. It's like you ever say a word over and over and over and you, you forget how to say it? And then you forget what it means and it just becomes like, Ugh, you know, like, like Charlie Brown's teacher, like, wow, wow. <laughs> Grace and peace can be like that. Grace is something that reminds us that we don't deserve any good thing from God. Okay? And that's easy for someone like me to, to, to realize and to acknowledge because I'm a creep, okay? I came from a cretin background. Um, I had no grace. I had no polish, no nothing. You know, I was, I was horrible. Um, and I had no peace. I didn't know it. I didn't realize I didn't have any peace until I had peace. And wow, this is a trip. <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, yeah, I'm from the 80s, yeah. <laughs> but you, f you feel this weight lifted off your shoulders. Amen. You know, and unfortunately, sometimes we forget how that feels. But Paul doesn't want us to. He, he, he wants us to be like these Thessalonians. He goes on in, in verse 2, verse 3 now. He says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. So I think what he's saying, at least it makes the most sense to me this way, where he says that we're bound to thank God always for you, is if you read both letters and, and all the letters that Paul talks about how he worked for his food, he never took a penny from anybody, except maybe the, the Philippians and possibly the Thessalonians. But Paul really worked hard to fulfill his ministry, okay? But even though he did that, he was bound to thank God always for them. Well, why? Because he knew he didn't create the changes in them. All he did was be faithful to his ministry. The other thing is, I think Paul was very careful not to take credit. He didn't want to touch the glory. You know, and that could be easy, you know, because I, hey, that's easy for me. Yeah, I, I told, oh, you should have heard what I told them, you know, it's like, um, yeah. And, but Paul is very careful. And he calls them brethren. And he says again that, you know, it, we're bound, you know, it, it's almost like he has to, it, he's obligated to thank God because he knows how this change happened. He knows what the source and the process of them changing was for the work that God had done through them, okay? And then he lists these two things. He says, because your faith grows exceedingly, how do you know if a person's faith grows exceedingly? How do, you, how do you mark that? I think the best way is when you see them not holding on to stuff, holding on to their rights, holding on to what's due them, 
trying to grasp their little corner of the world and fighting for the breadcrumbs, you know, like the little birds out there and they're trying to get the one piece of popcorn or something. Uh, a lot of time the world looks like that to me. You know, they're all trying to fight for this one crumb. <laughs> and it's important to them. And the reason I think it's important to them is because, you know what? For them, this is as good as it gets. But we need to remember that it's not like that for us. <laughs> this is the worst it's going to get. Okay? And it's been pretty bad lately with COVID and people going nuts at corporate levels and just, you know, you watch TV and just politicians and they're, they're wacko, you know. They're, I could throw out some more 80s expletives, but I won't. You guys won't be using words like groovy and stuff. Um, but because their faith grew exceedingly. And the other thing that he mentions is the love of every one of you abounds towards each other. I think those are the marks of a surrendered church where you have people who are willing to give up their rights, give up their expectations, their ambitions and so forth and, and just trust God you know, every day, I, I wish I had this magic bazooka that I could shoot people through the Zoom camera. And that's bad. I'm a pastor, right? But it's like, and it's not because I'm mad. It's just because they say the darndest things. Let's put it that way. It's like, what's the Texas thing? Bless their hearts. Bless their hearts. And it's like, I, I shouldn't be that way. And, and I'm getting better at it. You know, some of you have been around for a while and you know me. I, I hope you think I'm getting better at it. <laughs> I think I am. Um, but these two things, these marks of these people, you know, their faith grows exceedingly beyond measure. Surrendered churches are filled with what? Surrendered people. So effective churches aren't powerful. You know, I, I don't go around telling everybody, oh, our church has all these programs and we got all this big screen and we have this orchestra and all that. But I tell people, we have a good church. We have nice, loving people that I, I love and that I can depend on and I've grown, you know, working shoulder to shoulder in the ministry. Jasmine, don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> She's going, what? <laughs> but I do brag about the church. Just like Paul did. He brags about them. He's going to talk about that. He boasts about them in the next verse. But what we boast about is that our people are surrendered. You know, that's, that's a, a mark of maturity. The measurements and benchmarks of the culture of the world are so topsy-turvy. Everything in the kingdom of God is upside down. If you want to be the greatest, you got to be the least servant. You know, the, the, the organizational chart in the church is Jesus and then everybody else, okay? Amen. At my work, it's the CEO and then everybody else from top down. It's different. You know, we're countercultural, okay? And because of that, it's hard to live here. It really is. It's hard. Um, and the older you get and the more invested you get into it, it can get harder. So for you younger people, don't invest in this kingdom. Seriously. Invest in the other kingdom. Verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you, okay, among the churches of God, for your patience and faith. That's, that's really interesting. Your patience and faith as you just sing Christian praises all day long and watch Christian TV and plant tulips all day long and hold hands. And No, he says, in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. You know, that's another theme that Paul covers a lot. Suffering is a characteristic of the Christian life. It's to make us let go. It's also to make us 
be partners with Christ in his afflictions and sufferings, okay? And it also, you know what, I, 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 my opinion, I think it bears in scripture, but I don't think you can actually be the best servant you can be until you're broken. And that just happens, I mean, because of who you are. And Paul says that a lot too, just be who you are. You know, you're a Christian, let go of that stuff. Why are you fighting about that? Why are you trying to hold on to these fleshly things? Why are you making excuses, and I'm talking to me, to hold on to these things that you know you shouldn't even be doing or wanting or looking at or whatever. These, these opinions you hold, these, these, these thoughts of yourself that you think you're so much more than you are. And Paul just says, just be who you are. You're, you're a sinner saved by grace. But you're a sinner saved by grace who has the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Amen. You know, and your father has the cat, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Not that that's, you know, but you know what I'm saying? He will give you everything you need. And so Paul goes on and he talks about this more in verse 5. That the fact that they endure, that they have patience and faith during these persecutions and tribulations... Well, that's evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, okay? So what he's saying is that that patience is evidence of God's righteous judgment because they were thriving in the midst of persecution and tribulations. You have a choice, you know, I, I, th those of you who are familiar with Xavier Reese in Pasadena, Calvary Chapel, Pasadena, I, I love that guy. He used to say, you know what? You can be bitter or you can be better. You know? And, and Paul's saying that here, I think, too. That you, you got to make a choice. You know, you can just say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, my background, uh, my sociological upbringing, um, nurture versus nature, um, I don't have a chance. Or you can be who you are. If you're a Christian, man, your, your life has changed. It's different. You have so many things. I mean, this is it. This is as bad as it's going to get for you. And then you have, I mean, there's not even time in eternity. Eternity isn't a lot of time. It's timeless. <laughs> there isn't time. It just is. And you're going to be there with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's pretty awesome. And we forget that. And that's what Paul's trying to remind us. You know, um, turn to 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And this hand, you guys pray for me. This hand, I've got this funny bone thing. The nerve here is like, this hand's like dead right here. I was talking to my brother over there. He told me to get a brace and I need to get one. But So if, you, if my hand just flops, that's why. So 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. And, and I want to I wanna point out something here. You know, in verse 4, Paul was boasting, right? He says he, he boasts. So we ourselves boast to all the churches about the Thessalonians and how they were dealing with the persecutions and tribulations they faced. You know why? Because they got it. They understood. How did they do it? Well, let's see. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. Now, on Saturday mornings, I usually have the guys read. But since you don't all have mics, I'm going to read. Oh, wrong book, sorry. 2 Corinthians. More old, little, excuse me, that's Greek. <clears throat> that's Greek for I messed up. Uh, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So he's talking to this church in Achaia, in, in Greece, Corinth. And he mentions the grace that God has bestowed on these churches in Macedonia. It would include Philippi and Thessalonica. Okay? That in a great trial of affliction, 
the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. You know, have you ever seen like generous people who have nothing? I have. It, it's, it's kind of sad in a way but, because it makes me feel bad that I'm not like that. But it's cute. It's really cute. You know. Um, and, and I've gotten some stuff, you know, people being generous. It's like, I really can't use this. <laughs> but, you know, it's just the thought that people would share what they have. And, and he goes on. He says that they abounded in the riches of their liberality, their generousness, their generosity. Verse 3, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. What he was doing, Paul was collecting money for the Jewish church. They were experiencing some um, shortages. Different commentators think it was because of they were selling their lands and they were you know, trying to have this commonality and so forth and could have been because of the persecution that was starting to happen uh, from the Jews. But in any case, Paul was collecting from all the churches. And he makes this point that these poor churches were giving what they could. Kind of like the widow's might. All she could give. But then they were going above that. And beyond that somehow. And he was basically saying, I think here, that you know, I, I try to tell them it's okay, but they just kept giving me stuff. <laughs> okay? And one of the things he's doing here, if you read First and Second Corinthians, they had money. They had these patrons that would sponsor different speakers and so forth. And so there was a kind of, remember when Paul says that not many wise, not many noble and all that? Because they were all trying to act like something they weren't because they had patrons. Okay? And Paul's all about just be who you are. You're a Christian. You're saved by grace through faith. And he goes on. He says, And the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, and not only as we had hoped, okay, because Paul was hoping they would give because he knew them, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Sounds like Romans 1 and 2, uh, 12, 1 and 2, huh? Also sounds like I know John was teaching about this a few weeks ago, where he had he wanted to feed the five thousand, and uh, Jesus said, "Well, what do you have?" And they said, "Well, this kid over here has you know two loaves of fish and five fish and two loaves or whatever." And he kind of wondered, "Well, how did Andrew know that?" You know, without you know, he was he like kind of going through like, "What do you got? What do you got? What do you got?" You don't, don't know, but. One of the principles I think John drew out, which matches this, is that sometimes we don't have what it takes to do what God wants us to do, but we bring Him what we have. We let Him bless it. Let Him multiply it. And guess what He does? He gives it back to you so that you can minister. But you got to give it to Him first. And that's hard because, like I said, I want the credit. And if I give it to Jesus, then no one's going to know that I was a part of this maybe, you know? And I, or I give it to him, I got a little string there, so he starts walking away with it and I pull it out of his hands. <laughs> but you, you see the principle? That you got to give yourself. So once we give ourselves, once we're surrendered, we're a surrendered church, we're surrendered people, and we're able to deal with these things, these difficulties in life with grace and with power and with, you know, not, not, not responding in kind, with love, you know, then we can actually make an impact on the culture around us. So in verse 5, like we said, Paul says that the fact that they were able to live like this was evidence of God's righteous judgment. Okay. Uh, Vanessa, you have to sit right here. Everybody, Vanessa's here. 
verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Ooh. What does that mean? So a righteous thing for God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. I kind of think he means this. Instead of me sitting there going like, oh, I wish, I wish, you know, I, oh, I can't wait till they're not, you know, they're not looking or, or I can't wait till their review comes up and, or whatever. He's saying that, you know, these things God's going to deal with, you know. Trust that if God's going to deal with something, he's going to deal with it righteously and fairly, okay? You know, one of the greatest tools and comforts that we have as, a, as believers in dealing with persecutions and tribulations is knowing that in the end, everything will be fair. Everything will make sense when it's all said and done. Okay? Amen. So if God's taking care of it, you can't say like, oh, well, God's not going to do it. God's going to bless that person. I, what, what, you know, I, I start sweating it because that person's getting, well, God is doing that for a reason that I don't know. And maybe he's using me to bring that person in the kingdom. You know, what a privilege that is. And so it's a, a righteous thing with God to repay. But that also means that, well, guess what we're not supposed to do? Take things in our own hands. And that's very tempting. You know, there, there are times, of course, where, you know, you have to deal with things. And I'm not talking about those things are pretty obvious. But I think what he's saying, though, is that in the culture that they lived in, in the culture that we live in now, you need to pray for people. Because guess what group they're in? They're in group two. They're going to hell. Okay? And, and, and when I say this, I'm learning this, too, because I am not... I'm still going through it. I'm still going through the process of trying to love those who, because I tell you, this whole COVID thing and the financial crisis that we seem to be coming into and everything, it's making people into jerks, okay? A lot of people. And it's really difficult <laughs> to work with them and to, or to not just work. I don't mean like working, working, but to, you know, to be around people, to watch TV, to even talk to, you know, some people. And you know what? we're better off just being witnesses for Christ. You know, because that's all that really matters. So instead of just wondering like, oh, well, you know, I was slighted. I didn't get this. Nobody likes me, whatever. You know, let God take care of that. Because He will. <laughs> He'll take care of it. In the end, it's all going to be fair. No, you're not going to be in heaven going, oh, I wish, I wish. No, you're not. You're going to be like, I, I'd be, I'm going to be so surprised I'm actually there, you know. <laughs> in verse 7, he says, and to give you who are troubled in that day, rest with us. Paul's, in, you know, including himself and Sylvanus and, and Timothy. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. What's that sound like? Second coming. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's group two. Group two will be in flaming fire. Now, the question for us is, oh, do we go, yeah! <laughs> or do we go like, man, you know. It should affect you. You know, because there are a lot of people that you know that are going to hell. And they're taking a beating, you know, now in the process. But you hear Christians talk about the eternal perspective a lot. It's important. You have to have an eternal perspective if you want to be an effective Christian. And I've said this before from here, and I say it on Saturdays with the guys. You know, I picture Paul walking through life with this telescope. He's got one eye on eternity. So it's a reality. He can see it. He sees it on the other end of that lens. 
but he's still walking through the same stuff you guys walk through. It's, it's, it's a duality. that has to be a reality for all of us as Christians. And so verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So hell is a real place. Okay? It's going to happen. There will be a time where the gauntlet falls and God's going to judge everybody except those that he doesn't judge. The ones who are saved by grace. Remember we talked about grace in the beginning. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Because now we have peace with God. This is the opposite of that. These people don't have peace with God. So that's why when he comes in verse 10, in that day to be glorified in his saints, that's us, and to be admired among all those who believe, that's us, because our testimony among you is believed, but at the same time, in verse 9, these, those, the others, group 2, will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. They're both realities. It's, it's going to happen, okay? And, and, and my, my hope is that we can learn not to take it for granted, okay? That we don't live in cheap grace. You know, because grace is very expensive. It wasn't, it was, it's not free. It's free to us. But it costs somebody a lot. Verse 11, we're almost done. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling, of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him. You know, it's reminiscent of, of John you know, with, with the prayers where John's talking about you, us and him and him and us and all this, this, this relational stuff about being in Christ and being in the Father and him and us and us all together. You know, it's, it's like this interrelational thing where we're a part of this through grace. We're part of this relationship that we cannot take for granted. According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, act like who you are. You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. You know, we don't need to be... There's... there's I'm going to throw this in for free. This is what I call a freebie. Christians should be the biggest givers. And I don't mean just financially. Or, you know, like, oh, here's $2 or whatever. Or $10 or but of yourself, okay? Because there's another group of people that I would call takers. Takers can be in the church. They're just immature and they haven't gotten it. They're not like the Thessalonians who got it, okay? But for us to be effective, to be all that God wants us to be, to be like these guys, or you know, people are boasting. Paul's telling people and hearing about their, 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 you know, their, their experiences before he even opens his mouth. We got to be givers, okay? And what I mean by that is just not hold on to things tightly. If God wants to take something, and I know I'm going to go home, and He's going to take something, I'll give you an example. I think I shared this with most of you. I'm getting very personal here, okay? So if you guys got tissue, you might want to take it out. So um, I bought this laptop. I've had this laptop for like, what, seven or eight years or something like that, uh, HP. And uh, this is better than the bird story. And uh, it was okay. It was really slow down and everything. So I, I ended up buying a Dell. I was coveting a Dell. So I bought a Dell. You know, I was working a lot of overtime. This is another story about work. And, ugh, but I had a lot of overtime, so I bought this Dell. And I'm sitting there, and I'm on the phone, and I'm with my fake bazooka shooting people through the Zoom and on the phone. And I've got my earphones, 
my little earbuds. Okay, what do they weigh? Nothing, right? Earbuds from your iPhone. And so somebody just told me that probably the, what I thought at the moment was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> okay. And everybody in the area was like, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> which is really weird. It reminded me of the emperor and no clothes, which I, I, I get every day I'm going through that. It's like, oh my God. But, and it's in all walks of life. So I don't know why. I was doing really well. You know, I, I have accountability person here that I talk to about my anger issues sometimes and doing better, better. But this one time I just, I just yanked the earphones off and literally paused for a second and I think I had this thought that they're just little tiny earphones. So I threw them down on the desk and they bounced up and hit the screen on my brand new laptop. <laughs> and it went dark. <laughs> yeah, it went dark. So I uh, had to order a new screen, learned how to take that apart, put it back together. So I got a new skill out of it, but the laptop, I'm still putting stuff together. But the moral of that story is be who you are. I could have, I, I didn't even pray. I just let, you know, my flesh get the best of me for a second. Your flesh will kill you. Okay? So we don't want that to happen. So be like Paul says be who you are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we. Uh, Thank you for this evening, Lord, and uh, we thank you for whatever we can glean from your word tonight. I just pray that I didn't share too much and that people still like me. <laughs> just kidding, Lord. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. We thank you for everything that you give us, Lord. You know, we thank you for these times where we can sit here together and we can think about you. We can ponder you. We can think about all the wonderful things that you've given us, Lord, where we can just let go of the world and all the things that hold us tightly and possess us, Lord, that our possessions possess us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can sit here, we can have times of just uh, meditation and listening and just pondering your word and letting you transform us through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the power of your word. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to allow you to help us to surrender to you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Oh, you guys got a lot of free time. <laughs>